ice cream. It's kind of our thing at Brahms. We've been handcrafting sundaes for over 50 years, and now we're bringing you four new creations. Dulce with salted caramel truffles, red velvet with chocolate brownies, vanilla with churros and streusel, and lemon with blueberry and pound cake. Brahms' new sundaes are each a unique masterpiece bursting with irresistible sweetness in every bite. And they're only available for a limited time at Brahms. Because ice cream, it's our thing. everybody and welcome to another edition of Dodgers Dialogue. I'm Alex Friedman in Oklahoma City and we are glad to be joined this week from his home in Chicago. It's outfielder Zach Rex. And Zach, first of all, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. Uh, how are you and your family doing out there in Chicago? Has everyone been able to stay safe? Yeah, everyone's been staying safe. Uh, we've been, you know, trying to find stuff to keep us busy around the house, but I live in the city and my parents live uh, just right outside of the city on the south side in uh, an area called Orland Park. So uh, they come out to the city, you know, twice a week, three times a week maybe. I, they try to. They're about like a 30-minute drive away. So uh, last night, me and my mom made uh, some whipped coffee. <laughs> okay. So that, that was kind of fun. But we've been, we've been finding some stuff to do here and there. My dad and I are playing the guitar together a little bit here and there. So it's been fun. What uh? What songs have you tackled so far on the guitar? I'm a huge Mumford and Sons guy, so um, like Mumford and Sons, Vance Joy, uh, the Lumineers. Like I'm I'm a big folk kind of guy, so um, I I I generally just just whatever I'm feeling that day to learn. I usually take about 15, 20 minutes to learn the song at the end of the night. But usually my dad and I are going through lessons each day, so. Right now, I'm learning actually how to do uh, some play some blues music. Had you ever played before this? I played guitar for uh, probably about I'd say five five to six years. Okay. So I've, I have a little bit of experience with guitar, but uh, I'm also learning how to play the piano right now in my free time. So <laughs> it got just uh, I'm just trying to be a one man band right now. <laughs> <laughs> just add a harmonica and an accordion, and then you'll uh, you'll have it all set. So. Uh, Baseball-wise, though, uh, what kind of activities are you able to do to be able to to stay ready for whenever that call comes that things might start to be put in motion to resume? Uh, you you just want to stay as, as ready as possible. You know, it's not – we don't know the end of time of this. We don't know what's going to happen. So, you know, staying ready and staying in that mindset. Uh, I think in spring training, uh, Mookie, Mookie said it the best, honestly. He said that. Uh, train with a sense of urgency and, and keep that keep that urgency mindset so uh, I'm always training with a sense of urgency still and whenever I get in the gym I'm, I'm able to get in about right now f four times a week is kind of where I'm sitting at right now so I'm still being able to get out there but I gotta make sure that I stay away from everybody <laughs> uh, make, make sure I stay safe so uh, it's tough getting in the gym but uh, usually I get in there I'm I'm totally alone so that's always good uh hitting wise you told me uh, earlier you're able to do a little bit outside sometimes but that certainly can be a, a challenge when you live in chicago still here in the middle of uh, april so um definitely a, a big uh, big difference from out there in arizona during spring training but um how much repetition and hitting are you able to do kind of on a weekly basis to stay sharp Right, around, right now, it's kind of looking about three to four times a week. I'm able to get in the uh, in the facility to hit and uh, take some flips, take some take some off the machine. Just kind of, you know, still kind of working on stuff, though. You know, still videotaping yeah. myself every day to make sure I, you know, I'm keeping on track and I'm making improvements because you, you can always work on something. That's the thing. Like, you never figure it out. So <laughs> uh, we're finding little things to work on here and there and keeping busy with that. And I'd say right now about three to four times a week. But when that time gets closer to kind of know what we have in front of us, uh, kind of like the time frame and all that, then I'll start getting in there a little bit more. 
Uh, so last season, great season for you. Began the year at Tulsa, spent most of it with us in Oklahoma City, and really saw a big spike in your power production earlier in your pro career. The, the hits had been there, the batting average had been there, but it was the power. And, and they say the power sometimes uh, comes last. And I'll ask you, when was it, what point of the season last year did you kind of realize things might be a bit different for you? Uh, I'd, honestly, I'd, I'd say game one. Um, okay. game, game number one, I hit a home run, uh, my third at bat. It was my third and my fourth at bat. And uh, I remember my buddy Eric Peterson on the double-A uh, team last year. He, uh, he's a utility guy for us in our organization. He came, to me, came up to me in the dugout, and he worked a lot with me in 2018 season and uh, offseason and just training in the offseason together a little bit and figure some stuff out with the swing. And he turned to me and said, dude, that's, that's, that's going to be – that's different. And he gave me a, he gave me a hug. And, and from that point on, it was like, all right, let's, let's, let's start to go to work now. So – uh, some of your favorite memories from your time uh, with the team at Oklahoma City joined us uh, in, I think, mid-May or so about last year and then spent the rest of the year, had great numbers. But, but some of your finder me fonder memories, whether it was uh, team accomplishments, individual accomplishments, or anything like that. Uh, I mean, as far as, like, personal performance goes, like what I remember from last season, I really don't remember much, honestly. <laughs> Uh, I, I do remember when Ben Moore hit that home run to left field, and that was kind of awesome. Yeah, for the July. Uh, coming off. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that's really hard to do. Come off the you know, come off the bench and 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 just perform like that. It's awesome. So, like moments like that, like moments seeing guys like uh, hit balls a thousand feet. You know, Edwin, Edwin Rios hit a ball like five hundred and something feet last year. That was sick. <laughs> There's just a bunch of guys that made strides last year, and seeing guys get called to the show is probably the most memorable thing in AAA. Like seeing that childhood dream come true to some guys and just seeing what that looks like for them. It's just, it's just cool to see, you know, it's cool to see people succeed like that. So uh, that's probably the most like fond memories that I have in AAA last year. And it doesn't really revolve around myself. I, I when I go out there, I really don't care what I do. <laughs> it's just, I'm going to put, put my best in the field every day. And uh, the people around me kind of what fuel my, my love for the game so well we had a uh, manager Travis Barbary on our uh, last episode and uh, he was certainly saying some great stuff about you and, and the rest of the guys um, and he mentioned you were one of the guys that he felt kind of did a lot for himself in spring training this year it was your first time in big league camp and he said well I think a lot of the management knew that he could hit, but they really opened some eyes that he could be a contributor this season. Tell us about that first chance to, to be in big league camp and some of the things you took away from it. Uh, yeah, big league camp was just such an incredible experience for me. Uh, it's kind of, I don't know, it was just, I couldn't really describe it to a lot of people, honestly. Like all my friends are like, dude, like, what did, what did you get to do? Like, how was your day today? Like, uh, honestly, it was just – I was in awe the whole time, like just the opportunity given to me and being able to be around guys that have been there, done that, and just to hate, like hear everything they have to say to you and all the all the advice and all the opportunities that <laughs> just being on the same field playing defense and BP is, is huge. And all the uh, – I've learned a lot already from those guys. And just getting like, a better connection with those guys, like getting to know them a little bit more and more personal level is, is kind of like, you know, this, it's kind of the goal in spring training is to get to know your team a little bit more, work on your skills together and, uh, you know, start, start running for that championship. So uh, it was just an incredibly humbling experience and it was just such a cool opportunity. Well, you referenced uh, Mookie Betts earlier, and uh, you just talked about uh, being able to really get to know some of the veterans you hadn't before. Were there maybe a couple that you really gravitated towards and were able to connect with? I mean, obviously, I gravitated towards the guys that, you know, I played in AAA with last year. Mm -hmm. and I connected a lot with uh, Rios and Beatty and uh, just a lot of – just all the guys, honestly. Like, everybody helps out. You know, Mookie helped a lot with me on defense. It took a lot of defense with him that – I maybe took like four or five times of defense with him, but just the amount of information that he was able to kind of help me out with and 
uh, seeing him practice the way he does kind of make, puts, it puts things in perspective on how you need to carry yourself and how you need to go about spring training and go about your, your sense of urgency. And uh, there's just a ton of guys that have helped me out. There's no, there's no one guy. So um, even on the hitting side, there's great coaches and just so many, co- just so much opportunity. So our organization is great with, with all that. So that was fun. Yeah, well, uh, between Mookie Betts and Cody Bellinger, those are a couple of guys uh, that are pretty good to learn from uh, out there in the outfield, a couple of gold glovers. Um, Something else that that happened in in spring training, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, uh, when I was there before things uh, got shut down, it was kind of the first general meeting for for all minor league players and staff, and I know you were over on the big league side. Player development director Will Rhymes when he was addressing everyone, you know, his main message was there are no ceilings for any of you guys anymore. Uh, you can do whatever. And he brought up two people to exemplify what can be done and what can be accomplished in a season. One was Zach McKinstry. One was you to talk about your performance from last year. So when you hear that coming from the director of player development, almost setting you in a sense as what can be accomplished as a standard, I mean, how do you react to that? I mean, when you're in the when when you're in the same uh, conversation as Zach McKinstry, I mean that's <laughs> that, that's always a good thing. Like yeah. that kid is just phenomenal, just a phenomenal person, phenomenal player, and just a competitor. So, uh, and another guy is Luke Rayleigh. You know, Luke Rayleigh, Luke Rayleigh. We got Cody Thomas. We got we got all these young guys that are going to eventually get opportunities. So, uh, being in the same conversation as all those guys is always a good thing. But uh, I learned a ton from McKinstry. I hung out with McKinstry a lot in spring training. Uh, just such a great kid and such a great uh, competitor, man. Just when it comes down to it, like he's a gamer. So uh, I've definitely taken some stuff from all these different guys. And uh, it's good to have Rayleigh back. And he's such a great guy, too. And it's going to be a fun season when we get going. Well, after being around you a lot last year, I'm not surprised that you took a very humble approach and deflect the praise to uh, everybody else. But another product kind of of spring training was a lot of folks got to know your story. I remember when you and I really just kind of got to go everything and where you got to where you are today, uh, sitting at the dugout in Albuquerque and learning a lot of the details of your your college career and and kind of finding it almost uh, surreal and hard to believe. But L.A. Times had a big profile about you. So did The Athletic. Um, I know, like we just said, you're a guy that kind of, you know, likes to keep yourself very humble. But, you know, having those stories out about there that more people could learn about you, I know that's in a sense part of part of the business and part of the game. Um, so how did you enjoy being able to maybe tell that story to a wider audience? Uh, <laughs> it was just I get text messages from people that, I, you know, I didn't I haven't talked to in a long time and get to, you know, reconnect with them and talk about it a little bit. and. They're like, I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea you were even playing. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I've been playing for about, you know, three, four years now. So uh, it's just good to, you know, get those stories out there for people that are, you know, not as fortunate with the amount of opportunities that they're given because there's, ke- there's a lot of kids out there that don't get opportunities to play Division One baseball. And there's a lot of guys that don't get scholarship money offered to them. So they have to, you know, they have to grind in, uh, say, JUCO or Division Two, Three. But there's a lot of guys out there that, need to hear those kind of stories so they can uh they can pursue their dreams no matter what so that's kind of where I'm at right now with it all like <laughs> I just want people to know that it is possible to do anything there is no ceiling so um when someone tells you you can't do something uh it's probably the it's probably what you needed to hear you know it's probably what you needed to hear in order to get to your end goal and as of right now I'm not anywhere near my end goal so uh the end goal would be to win a World Series <laughs> with the Dodgers. So that's that's what I got on it. So we'll, we'll retrace a couple of those steps for those who aren't maybe as familiar. So you, you go to Air Force out of high school, the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Um, I assume there are other NCAA Division One schools that were recruiting you out of high school, but what was it that, that made you want to go to the Air Force at least to start your collegiate career? Uh, I wasn't given a lot of scholarship opportunities out of, out of high school. So uh, Air Force happened to be just one of the schools that offered me, uh, you know, they have to offer the full ride basically because it's, yeah. uh, it's the free place to go, but you know, there's a lot that comes with it. Right. But uh, when I visited, I just felt like uh, 
I wanted to be a pilot. I felt like I wanted to eventually serve in the military for, uh, you know, the five year commitment that they, that they have you do at the end. But after being there for a little bit, I just, I kind of, I kind of shift in my mindset and kind of, you know, went another direction with the way I wanted my life to go and uh, decided that I might want to, I might as well just, you know, give up that opportunity for someone else who deserves it. So uh, if your heart's not fully into it, you shouldn't be there. So I just left. And you end up at the University of Kentucky, but not as a traditional baseball playing transfer. You went there ba- just as a regular student with hopes of playing baseball. Um, you mentioned guys who worked their way up from the junior college levels before. Was there any ever consideration maybe to spend a year at a junior college to play and then transfer somewhere else? And, and how is it exactly that you decided that, that maybe Kentucky, even without the baseball spot, would be a better place for you? Um, I didn't. I, I thought I was done. I honestly thought I was done. Uh, I thought I would try out and maybe maybe make the team. And I, I didn't think that I could do it. So I didn't I didn't really put a lot of I didn't really put a lot of like commitment into anything. I just kind of I had a what I, what people don't know is that I had like a I had a really bad GPA at the Air Force Academy, uh, so bad that I couldn't even probably play. So uh, I thought that I needed to get my school in order first and. Uh, hammer out the grades first because I didn't think that there was going to be a future in professional baseball for me at all I didn't know what I was capable of and I didn't know uh I didn't have a lot of like uh, great guidance at to, up to that point and then uh, uh eventually just was working out you know working for Toyota uh doing some engineering stuff for them and uh did it for two years and then I was given an opportunity by one of the co- uh, the assistant coaches Rick Eckstein yeah, and I find it hard to believe, though, that a guy who now has a mechanical engineering degree and who worked at Toyota, like you said, actually had great troubles at one point. But I think that you could also turn it kind of part of your story, as you were telling guys earlier about those who might not get opportunities baseball-wise, maybe academically, too, that even if the grades aren't there, if you can keep working at it, things will uh, turn around for you. Um, you mentioned the chance meeting with uh, Rick Eckstein, then an assistant at the University of Kentucky. So after sitting out basically for two years, you make the team, you have a great two-year run there, uh, and then end up getting drafted as a, a fifth-year senior uh, by the Los Angeles Dodgers. And something I did not know until when I read one of those articles before was the White Sox called you earlier in the draft. And you, ba- you kind of politely said, eh, I don't know if that'd be the right thing to do. And you end up getting s- or drafted by the Dodgers in the 10th round. Fifth-year seniors don't have a whole lot of leverage on their side. So what was it kind of in your gut or your mind thinking that, you know, maybe there might be a different spot for me here in the draft? Uh, there's some people that, you know, that I've talked to during that whole process. And, you know, I've touched base with a couple of friends that were in – professional baseball and ask them, you know, what's it like, you know, what teams are good, what teams are good for, uh, good for you to go to uh, early in your career. And a lot of the time people would say the Dodgers and the Dodgers are one of the teams that called me early. So uh, I just, you know, they, they said, you know, would you take this? And I was like, yeah, uh, <laughs> why not? But uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of teams that called me early in the draft and, a lot of it had to, had to go through the agency first and all that, but uh, they, I just told the agency kind of what I wanted to, what I wanted to do, and what I wanted to do was get the best opportunity for myself to develop and be with the best. Um, I, I felt like that's what I needed, no matter what the financial hit was that I had to take in order to get that. Like I didn't really care, you know. When you're a senior, when you're a senior sign, you're not you're not real, you're not really in it for the money. <laughs> That's just what it is, you know, but uh, you're in it for for the long haul and you're in it for the grind. So if someone's willing to invest all that time into you, then you're going to give yourself the best chance. So the Dodgers, I felt like were the best opportunity that I had. So I went with it. Uh, Your signing scout, Marty Lamb, a guy who I don't think a lot of people know it or should more people should know about him because he signed Walker Beale, he signed Matt Beatty, signed Caleb Ferguson, signed you as well. Tell us a bit about uh, about Marty Lamb. And Will Smith. And Will Smith. <laughs> yeah, I knew I well, hey, it just shows you that, you know, he signed a lot of really good players. I was bound to forget one. I mean, 
Marty's a great guy. He, he, he really knows what he's looking for. He really knows what, what the organization needs. And I think that he's got such, you know, a, such great line of experience that he's just, he's the kind of guy that you want to get drafted by, you know, cause he's going to, and there's, there's been times where he's helped me in the off season too. Like he's not just a guy who's just going to, you know, draft you and be done and I'll see you later. Uh, he's given plenty of opportunity for me to come meet with him and in, in, at Kentucky because that's where he lives. Uh, when I was in the off season in 2018, before I had the 2019 season, I visited him. He visited me a couple times at the batting cage, gave his input, helped me video stuff. Like he helped me out tremendously. So it was, it was just good to get drafted by a guy that goes well and beyond the draft board. Uh, this year, and uh, I didn't have a whole lot of time to visit with you just because of schedules uh, in spring training, but I uh, got to let you know that you're, uh, you're on the cover of the, the pocket schedule this year, the OKC Dodger pocket schedule this year, which now truly is going to be a collector's item <laughs> because it's, uh, that schedule's not going to end up being the one the team necessarily plays. But uh, some guys think it's cool. Some guys think it's just, eh, whatever. Uh, you seem pretty excited once you found that out. It's just a cool opportunity. Like it, that doesn't get to happen to a lot of people. So uh, you got to be grateful for the opportunities you get in life. And that's just something that's cool for my family, you know, and uh, make my mom and dad proud. Like that's what you want to do in the game. So uh, my mom and dad were really ecstatic for it and they don't have a lot of pictures of me and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, it's getting pictures of me in, in, in an OKC Dodgers uniform and be able to be on a cover or something is kind of a cool opportunity. So I wasn't more excited for myself. I was excited for that I get to show that to my, get, get that stuff to my family. So. Well, you can let your parents know that we've got not only a lot of other schedules, but uh, any pictures. Trust me, we've got plenty of pictures of you uh, that we can always send to them if, if they ever need more. Um, we, Like I mentioned before, we, we talked with Travis previously, and he said um, he, himself as well as the other coaches there uh, doing checking in via Zoom with a lot of you guys as well. Um, so how have those conversations been going? Those conversations have been pretty uh, productive. We just get in there. We talk about, you know, what's been going on. They give us an update as far as the medical staff goes and, and kind of what the plan is going forward. And uh, they give us an update on, you know, future things to come with how development's going to work uh, from home. And I think we're going to be doing about two meetings a week for positional players. So it's just good to connect with the guys too and see what they're up to and uh, see what's been going on with everybody and just kind of keep in touch but they've been going pretty good. Uh, you mentioned earlier some of the things you've, you've been doing during this time, like uh, picking up the guitar and piano. We talked about your engineering background. So have you used that maybe to work on any building projects or building or putting together puzzles or anything like that? Uh, right now, I haven't, I haven't been putting any puzzles together. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe I'd say the closest thing to do is we've been playing a lot of call of duty you know strategies you know all okay. that stuff <laughs> kind of a game of chess but uh the guys get together we play some call of duty we play the Fortnite. uh that passes the time a little bit and along with the piano i mean my brain's working pretty hard <laughs> as it is because i'm terrible at the piano <laughs> Well, it's, you brought up video games. I was going to ask that. I myself don't really play video games, but I know a lot of guys have been either it's something they already do and now they have more time to do it, or some people are even getting into them for the first time in a long time. But Gavin Lux is in that MLB The Show tournament. Have you watched any of his games so far? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, if you guys want to check it out, it's G Lux 9, I believe. And that guy's been killing it, honestly. <laughs> uh, we play – my squad in, in Call of Duty is usually uh, Lux and a couple of his friends and a couple of my friends from Chicago. So um, definitely have been killing, killing the game. Uh, he's been doing great in the show, and he's been doing great in Call of Duty. So if you guys, haven't, if you guys don't know about it, Lux is one of the best Call of Duty players I've ever seen. So <laughs> just check him out. Would you say he's the best in the Dodgers organization? Uh, 100%. Okay. <laughs> In the entire organization, I think. He's As if he's not, like, good enough at enough things already. Yeah. Everything the kid picks up, he's good at. So uh, you wouldn't expect anything less. Uh, how about 
TV shows, Netflix? What what have you been watching during this time? I'd say the Ozarks. The Ozarks is kind of like that's what Travis what, said he's been watching. Yeah, I love the Ozarks. Uh, basically, anything I can I, honestly anything. Uh, lately, I've been watching actually a TV series that I used to watch with my dad a long time ago, uh, named Chuck. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's it's Sounds just about vaguely a, familiar. It's about a guy that you know he he basically gets he gets all this information to become a secret agent, and he becomes a secret agent out of nowhere, and he's just an average average Joe uh, working at like a like a tech store, and he gets slapped in the face with having to deal with being a secret agent all of a sudden. <laughs> All right. Well, I know you're a Chicago guy. Did you watch the first uh, couple episodes of The Last Dance? That is literally what I was going to do today. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't watched it yet. I'm probably going to wait till it's all like out at once. But yeah, I that is the plan today. Someone told me about it uh, through my workout this morning, and I have to go and watch it now. So (laughs) I'll be doing that the rest of the day. All right. A um, couple of other ones before we dive into some uh, questions that fans submitted. Um, a lot of people probably don't know that you're very fond of avocados. Uh, you've got avocado swag, shirts, headbands, socks. Where did that, how did that all start? Uh, I believe that it was because <laughs> uh, Blake Galen. Um, Blake Galen commented on my avocado shirt one day and how he hated it. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that I wore it in spite of him almost every single road game. I'd pack it and I would just put it on and I'd take BP in it. <laughs> and then I started ordering avocado headbands and uh, I started wearing avocado headbands. And it just honestly it was because someone hated it. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do it and make them love it <laughs> and just be okay with myself and being myself. So uh, the guys, I, I think, I think they're kind of fond of avocados now, but you know, it's just, it's something that I like doing. So. All right. Well, I thought you just really liked eating avocados, but now I know it was a, it was a love that was built out of spice. So like uh like Larry David's spite store. I don't know if you watch Curb Your Enthusiasm, but. That was a big, uh, basically starts a coffee shop out of spite in this past season out of somebody else. So there you go. Um, hey, Blake does own an avocado headband now. Okay. So he does have one too. And we, we do sometimes, we, we were sometimes wearing them together. So it became, it became a thing. Okay. So now we'll dive into some uh, questions from the fans uh first one from jake 6250 what is it like to take the field on opening day it's a special day man it's you get it's it's the one game where you get a little extra butterflies in the stomach and a little bit of a a little bit of you know you just get that the, the kind of like the shakes a little bit you're just super excited to get out there with with all the guys and you got you had all that that off season of preparation so it's the first day that you get to to showcase kind of what you've been working on. So it's, it's not a matter of like, you know, how you perform that day. It's just an exciting feeling. And it's the start of the season. Everyone loves it. Uh, From Nikki Bibby, if you could trade places with any other ball player, who would it be and why? (laughs) Uh, Trade places. (laughs) I don't, I wouldn't want to really trade places with anybody, honestly. <laughs> it's it's kind of just I'd, I'd like to be myself, you know. I'd like to, uh, you know, some people model their games after some people and they they try to imitate some people, but I'm not that kind of person really. Then I just kind of play my game. I like being myself, and I don't regret anything I do. Uh, also, we'll ask, what's your go-to meal or pregame meal? Oh, uh, we don't really get a, much of a choice. <laughs> uh, whatever's there in the in the clubhouse is what you're going to eat before the game. But if I had a choice, I'd probably go with some. Uh, I'd probably go with like a salmon, you know, something something lighter, uh, something that's going to get you going a little bit, but you're going to still feel light. But uh, you do need those carbs, though. You do need some uh, energy for the game. Uh, what was your favorite memory of playing at the University of Kentucky? Uh, I definitely say uh, 
probably sweeping Texas A&M. Um, we swept Texas A&M at A&M, uh, I think the opening SEC weekend. So that was, I think we were, we were in a really bad slump going into the game. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't know how we're going to do this this whole season. <laughs> like, we're, 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 we had a bad record. We got swept at North Carolina. Uh, Texas A&M was ranked, I think, like, you know, top five or top ten teams. And we got an opportunity to go in there, and we, we ended up pitching really well. I know Salo was in, on that team. So, Salo came in and threw, like, four, like, three solid days in a row. I think he came in every single game at the end of the game. And he just – he just tossed the ball, man. He just did it so well. And that was a cool feeling because I don't think Texas a ms ever gotten swept before at their own, at their own field. Wow. So that was a cool feeling. Um, from Summer Hayes, 35. This, I'm just going to read the question is exactly written. Pineapple on pizza? No. <laughs> okay. You can't do that. <laughs> Not in Chicago, at least. Like – it's I usually keep it to one topping, one topping at a time. I either go sausage or I go pepperoni. Uh but I'm more of a thin crust guy, even though Chicago is uh mostly deep dish. But I tend to only go thin crust when I'm just kind of chilling around. But if I'm going out to dinner, maybe on a date or something, definitely deep dish pizza. Which uh what's your favorite kind of deep dish? What uh what restaurant? I like Lumonati's. Uh, yeah, that's my favorite. I love, yeah, I love Lumonati's. I know that uh, Portnoy did a review on Lumonati's <laughs> uh, frozen pizza, and they got a good frozen pizza too. So that's always a good decision. But if I had to go thin crust, I'd probably go with Aurelio's. And uh, last question What was your favorite thing about Oklahoma City? Just the guys. <laughs> the guys, the coaching staff we had there was incredible. Uh, just such a great group of guys to be around and uh, you would not want any other uh, group of guys in order to, you know, get called up and see that, see that, see that, get them call and get in Trav's office, come out of Trav's office and uh, just see the look on their face. is just, these guys, those guys were amazing. So the fun team to be around. We always had fun each day. So it's a long season. So uh, you gotta, you gotta find ways to have fun and, and fool around with people and, that was just a great, a great group of guys to do it with. So, absolutely, and I'll back you up there. Even though uh, the wins and losses might not have been there, it was always fun every day coming to that clubhouse. Well, Zach Rex, we thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your schedule today to join us and let everyone know how you've been doing. Uh, we appreciate it, of course. Uh, stay safe, and we hope to see you soon. All righty, sounds good, guys. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh -huh.